Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. I know it's a long night. I appreciate your uh, continued interest. We've got some good people, some of you came up a ways to, to testify, so I really appreciate your, uh, your concern. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce House Bill 7585. Uh, the goal of this bill, as the chairman said, is to open up net metering to off-site generation. Uh, and by doing so, to significantly increase opportunities for renewable energy development in our state and to significantly expand who can access that renewable energy. Uh, I'm sure most of you understand the basics of net metering. Uh, I just want to give a little context for this bill and, and what we hope it can achieve for Rhode Island. Our current net metering law is designed to allow uh, people or institutions who put up uh, renewable energy development um, to receive credit back in exchange for the excess energy that that project um, delivers into the grid, uh, which the utility can then sell to other customers. And as you can imagine, that really helps the economics of these projects, and that's a very good thing because this kind of distributed generation has immense uh, ratepayer and systems benefits. For example, distributed generation systems are sited closer to the electric load, so the system saves money uh, on reduced uh, energy loss during transmission, uh, saves money on reduced need for expensive uh, transmission and uh, distribution infrastructure investments. Uh, and while, you know, from the perspective of utility profits, that might not be ideal um, because they have an interest in some of those investments. From the perspective of rate payers who have to pay for those investments, it certainly is a good deal. Another example, uh, distributed generation systems are mostly paid for by individual customers, so we're generating private uh, investment for public benefit at a fraction of the cost of utility scale projects. These developments are great for our local economy. We've heard a lot about this sector, how it's growing faster uh, than the rest of our economy. Uh, they bring uh, federal tax credits home to Rhode Island. These are local projects uh, with local labor, so there's economic benefits for the host community, communities. Obviously, they're clean and efficient, so there aren't the uh, you know, environmental justice, air quality concerns that a lot of utility scale uh, developments have. Uh, and maybe most importantly, I really want to stress this, uh, the vast majority of objective analyses of the costs and the benefits of these systems find that uh, dis clean distributed generation produces net benefits that are greater than the retail cost of electricity. So the claim, which I don't know if we'll hear tonight, but the claim that uh, net metering is a subsidy to renewables that's, that's greater than the fair valuation, that has no basis, there's no evidence for that. If anything, it is the customer who puts up a net metering system that is subsidizing the utility, not the other way around. So in a nutshell, that is net metering and why uh, from pretty much every perspective we should want to see more of it. The problem right now is that our current law prohibitively uh, keeps out too many people and institutions from taking advantage of this policy. Right now, net metering uh, only applies for a renewable project that is like, physically on your property. Um, but there are obviously so many opportunities for development that don't fit into that little box. For example, uh, only around one quarter of rooftops in Rhode Island right now are appropriate or eligible for solar systems, whether because of shading or not over-occupied or angling, etc. Um, so right off the bat, we are excluding three quarters of Rhode Islanders from joining this market. The same uh, can be said similarly for small wind generation. So by expanding net metering to include off-site generation, which is pretty much the entirety of what this bill does, we can ensure that every business Every nonprofit, every Rhode Islander uh, has access to clean, reliable, cheaper, renewable energy. That means a lot more demand for these projects, which means more hiring, more jobs, uh, more businesses to step up to fill that demand, uh, and more clean energy distributed right in the grid where it's needed. There's one more important thing that that means. Off-site net metered systems can be designed to serve multiple customers. Uh, so, that's good for prices because projects can take advantage of economies of scale which increase the, the ratio of benefits to, to costs. But even more importantly, that's really, really, really good from an equity lens. By serving multiple customers, off-site net metered systems provide a way for low-income Rhode Islanders, for renters to, um, to join together on community renewable projects that they otherwise would never be able to site, would never be able to afford. I hear the argument all the time that 
you know, clean energy that's just for the wealthy, you know, low-income families that don't, they don't really care about that, they don't want to touch that. I think it's absurd to say that working families uh, don't have just as much to gain, don't actually have more to gain from you know, cheap, clean energy. Um, but the fact is right now, their access to it is very limited. And so you know, as we're transitioning to a clean energy economy, we can't leave anyone behind. And that's why it's really important uh, that we expand virtual net metering to allow renters and low-income revivers to take advantage of it. So that is, uh, that's House Bill 7585. Uh, before I close, very briefly, I want to add there's one section of the legislation that uh, I would like to see amended if this bill were to move forward. The section begins on page 4, line 34. It basically says uh, the PUC should evaluate the costs and benefits of distributed generation and devise a credit or a charge based on that. Um, after some discussions with folks in the industry, uh, I think that section should be removed um, as the PUC will be doing that valuation study soon anyway. And so it, it doesn't really make sense to preemptively create any uncertainty for, for developments that are already in place. Uh, so with that in mind, I truly hope the, the committee will consider uh, this bill. Person, um, I'm looking at uh, page 4. Did I get the 34 page line from? So you look, mine shows the energy system benefit credit for a charge, means a credit or charge reflecting the net value of the eligible system. Are you sure you have the correct reference on that one? Yes, yeah, so that section is. So you're, if you're looking to remove line 34 on page 4 all the way down through line 5. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the benefits of offsite net metering are clear. It's the right thing to do. It's the smart thing to do. And I hope um, that we can consider this carefully and, and hopefully make it happen. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Uh, Chris Kearns, Office of Energy Resources. Good afternoon. Chairman, members of the I'll be very quick. Um, we applaud the uh, representative for his intent with the legislation. Um, however, we are, uh, the governor's office and the OER are recommending that uh, net metering is touched upon in the governor's budget article 18 that had its House Finance Committee hearing last week. Um, this committee passed the net metering bill uh, back in February. Uh, we are just recommending that the committee consider any further amendments to the net metering law be done in context within the budget article. Thank you. Questions? So, how would they be in contact? So, our the governor's uh, budget article touches upon uh, amending the net metering law, including opening up virtual net metering for more than the current customer classes. It also touches upon third party financing uh, to enable homeowners or businesses that don't have the money uh, to be able just to enter into a lease arrangement with a solar company to install it. Right now, the owner of the solar system has to be the customer on the electricity account. We're trying to remove that barrier. So is that the solar cities? Solar cities, next runs. Hasn't been doing business around pretty much at this point. They've been doing limited business over the last uh, 12 months, offering a loan type of arrangement where there's no money down. But there's still a barrier in terms of how our net metering law was passed. And, and, and so the budget article 18 addresses that. So budget article 18 addresses that. It also opens up virtual net metering. However, we are starting conversations with a number of stakeholders as to what the sweet spot in terms of a compromise that could be struck in terms of uh, the virtual net metering. Uh, so whether it's affordable housing that the representative mentioned or multifamily homes or community solar. So if you have 15 homes in the neighborhood but are surrounded by trees, but there's an off-site location where solar can be installed and then have that electricity go to those accounts, that's what the governor's budget article is intending. Our legislation is ultimately, I think, similar objectives but different ways of it being drafted. Uh, we recognize that the governor's article is going to be amended. Um, we would ask that um, any further amendments to the net metering law be done within that article. Questions? Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, Abigail Anthony from the Arcadia Center. She left. She's still here? No, she, she left. Here? Okay. We do have a letter for her from her. It's in our packet. So, uh, <coughs> about, uh, is it Bridget Ryan? Yes. And uh, you're the Emerald Cities? Emerald Cities, Rhode Island. Okay. Um, thank you, Chairman, and thank you for uh, the committee for allowing me to present these comments today. 
Um, as I just said, my name is Bridget Ryan. I'm the local director of uh, the Rhode Island Office of the National Emerald Cities Collaborative. We're a national network of organizations working together to advance a sustainable environment while creating economic opportunities for all. Um, I'm here to convey my support of this bill um, for three main reasons. The environment, which uh, Representative Rayenberg um, really touched on, um, but more importantly, or in addition to that, I'd like to say that this can help the state um, meet its uh, Resilient Rhode Island Act goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions by using more renewable energy that helps us um, towards the state's goals that, that um, have been set. Um, this uh, expanding renewable energy opportunities creates more jobs in Rhode Island um, and it creates greater equity for all of Rhode Islanders. The current net metering, um, our current net metering um, regulations limit um, limitations present a challenge to Rhode Islanders living in low income and minority communities. Access to capital, building ownership <coughs> structure, and affordability, among other things, are all impediments to the development of individual on site renewable energy generation. This bill expands the definition of net metering, allowing systems that are more accessible to communities otherwise left out of the current development model. And for that reason, we are supporting the SEPs. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear from uh, Paul McDonald from Kingsters. Paul, I think you've learned a lot of new things today, haven't you? Well, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, standing in front of a uh, nice celebration over on uh, Douglas Avenue, so I'm going to be brief. Uh, Teamsters are here in support of this legislation. Uh, renewable energy is something we can all agree on that is very important to us in our state and in our country and make no mistake about it, it's a big deal, it's coming towards us, but it also creates great opportunity for jobs, for families, for people to earn a living that uh, is a livable wage and uh, we support this wholeheartedly, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any questions for Paul? Thank you. Uh, Mike Daly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members uh, with the uh, Electricians Local 99 at EW. Uh, we stand in support of this legislation. Uh, and, and to piggyback uh, Mr. Kearns's uh, comments, uh, support the, the governor's uh, budget article 18. Uh, the, the expansion of renewable energies it is good, it's positive for the state, for the consumers, and, and for our environment. And for that reason, uh, we are in support of this. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, Cynthia Wilson Prius. Hi, Cynthia, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, thank you. And there should be a letter in your packet from Cynthia. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pretty technical letter, so I'm not going to go through it in depth, but if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, I think we can all agree that renewable energy is an important component of, um, of the Could you speak over here? The Public Utilities Commission, sure. Um, of our electric mix. Um, we are also working with OER on the governor's budget article um, to work on third party financing, third party ownership, um, and the expansion of availability of remote metering. Um, we want to be very careful to make sure we do this right um, so that we don't run afoul of any federal laws or other state policies. And so that's some of the things that the letter touches upon. Um, we think that this bill is a little too broad and would um, put us at risk of running afoul of some, um, some federal laws. And also, um, we need to be very careful. There are a lot of bills in this year to expand almost all of the renewable energy programs. We need to be very careful in doing that, that we understand exactly how they work together to make sure that the various state laws and policies aren't actually working counter to one another. So that's really all. Um, and as, um, as the sponsor mentioned, um, the commission has recently opened a new docket to look at the costs and benefits <coughs> of, um, <coughs> of the net metering, distributed generation, um, and various other programs in order to ensure that we're setting rates um, across all programs in a just and reasonable way. So we will be embarking on that 
um, and over the, probably over the next year looking at that and getting studies. Questions? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Andy, you know, Andrew runs the Center for Andrew here. Uh, Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to come in and speak today. My name is Andrew Grandy. I'm a resident of Cumberland, Rhode Island. Uh, and I also work for a company called Next Step Living that does community solar in Massachusetts. Uh, so kind of from my perspective, I've seen the benefits of the net metering, virtual net metering laws in Massachusetts. Uh, and because of that, you know, being a Rhode Island resident, I have to go to Massachusetts if, if I want to work in solar. Uh, but working there, uh, talking with residents of, of Plymouth and other residents across, across the state, people want to partake in clean energy. They want clean energy. They want to know that when they turn their lights on, they're not firing off a coal-fired power plant or a gas plant somewhere else in the state, putting pollution up in the air, and making a 10-year-old kid have an asthma attack in some way. Those are the consequences of our energy choices. What they want to do is they want to participate in clean energy. They want to see solar. They see it going up around the state. But there's oftentimes barriers to them participating in those programs. Just like the representative was saying, in Massachusetts, it's the same thing, whereas 85% of the homes there can't participate in solar because their house is shaded, it points the wrong direction, the roof is too old, or it's an odd shape. Uh, so they're able to participate in projects like community solar, where what we can do is reserve solar panels for them off-site in a solar garden, uh, somewhere 20 to 30 miles away from their home or even closer. The solar panels are there. The energy that those panels creates goes off the panels directly back to the utility, whether it's National Grid or Eversource. And in turn, the utility then pays them back by giving them credits in dollars back on their electric bill. Essentially, what we can do is, on average, we see people with, you know, say, $145 electric bill. We reserve those panels for them. They get a new solar payment for $130. Their electric bill goes away, and they know exactly how much they're going to be paying, which for a lot of people, especially retirees, new families, it's a burden off of them to not know, you know, take that burden off, what's my electric bill going to be this month? But with community solar, they know exactly how much they're going to be paying. They're saving money up front, and they're saving money in the long run, which is a win for families. It's a win for working families, just as we heard from the Teamsters and we heard from IBEW. Uh, what we've seen is 15,000 jobs created in Massachusetts over the last 10 years in the solar industry. And those are 15,000 Massachusetts people being put back to work that were previously in that industry. It's because of laws like virtual net metering. It's something that I'd like to see happen here so that I can come back to the island and partic part participate in the clean energy economy here in my home state. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Andrew? Thank you, uh, Julian Dash. Good evening. Thanks for having me. And everyone else who's here to testify. I'll try to be brief because we've had a long night. My name is Julian Dash from the Community Economy Development. We consult for municipalities, schools, and private businesses seeking to take advantage of clean energy um, opportunities. Uh, I come here in support of this bill. Um, I've been around the New London industry in Rhode Island probably longer than almost anyone in this community, <coughs> except for my colleague Fred. Um, some of you may remember uh, my time working for the state as the director of the state's New London Fund. And I say that in a historical context because over the years, we've seen the state participate and enact legislation uh, in, in a very thoughtful manner. And what that has done is really allow the state to move forward and develop programs that actually lower the cost of renewable energy and actually provide benefit to uh, the ratepayers. And this is just the next step of um, policies that will help continue to do that. So by expanding virtual net metering, we'll be able to actually see other institutions, whether it be affordable housing, whether it be businesses, take advantage of this policy, the same as municipalities have. So, for example, the town of Westport, who's a client of mine, they will be implementing three wind turbines that's using virtual net media, and they will save between 20 and 40 million dollars over the life of that project, which they can use to directly reinvest into their, their town. The city of Central Falls is doing the same thing, uh, a combination of solar and wind, they will save between seven and 10 million dollars uh, not just for the city, but also for the schools, but also for Central Falls public housing. So they are lowering and fixing the utility rates for all of their public housing residents through this program. There's a lot of economic value to be had uh, by implementing virtual net metering. We're just looking to expand that to a larger segment of the market. I think what is most important to highlight here 
is that historically we've spoken about renewable energy incentives as some type of subsidy or, or requiring some financial support from uh, the state. What this does is really more of a structural issue. It doesn't require any funding or dollars from the state, and it doesn't impose any impact to the rate payers. It's really a structural issue. So it's, it's you know, something that's totally economically positive, and it doesn't require any funding from the state, but will definitely promote uh, not just energy, but economic development goals as well. Any questions for doing it? Thank you. Frank McMahon for National Grid. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, Frank McMahon on behalf of National Grid. Uh, we are opposed to this piece of legislation as drafted. However, uh, we are going to meet with uh, the sponsor tomorrow morning about this bill and the second bill he has on your agenda this evening. Um, we echo what Chris Kearns indicated earlier that the process revolving that's been kind of starting to get established around the budget article seems to be the place where a lot of these issues are being talked about and discussed. This is probably the right place for this particular concept. Um, so with that, we've got a bunch of reasons, technical reasons in nature. I don't want to spell them all out now because it's getting late, but uh, we're going to meet with the sponsor tomorrow and then uh, we're also participating on the budget article, which I think is uh, going to be uh, a very good piece of legislation by the time it's done. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Uh, Etsy, is it Lunks? Lunks. Lunks. And Couch, Lunks. Okay. I'm with the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. That's just my great testimony. I didn't get to this time. Um, the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative is an organization that's committed to breaking the link between unhealthy housing and unhealthy families. And um, that may not seem like an obvious reason to be here today talking about energy issues. But we were started um, working on lead issues in homes, and we started to realize that families are dealing not just with lead, but energy efficiency and other problems in the home, and that it's all a big downhill spiral, spiral once one of those pieces goes. As a lot of you know, low-income housing, low-income families pay um, about 20% of their income for utilities, whereas the rest of us pay more like 3%. So I'm always looking for opportunities for the families that we work with to be able to participate in energy efficiency work, and this is a way that they would be able to do that. A lot of points that I was going to make were already made, um, but a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, is that you know we, we need to be moving as quickly as we can to get the infrastructure in place for a clean energy future. Um, waiting to do studies here, as the PUC um, suggested, I think is not necessary. We've done this in other states. We've done this in um, some of our other cities and towns in Rhode Island. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't just move forward with it. Thank you for, my, for hearing my remarks. Any questions? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Megan Coleman. From Sierra Club. Thank you, members of the committee chairman. Thank you for having me. My name is Megan Calm, and I'm uh, a board member and the political chair of the Rhode Island Sierra Club. We are also here today in support of this legislation. Um, thank you to Representative Regenberg for introducing it. So, for, for us, this is a question of climate change, and for us, virtual metering and an expansion thereof would help introduce sustainable electricity generation for the state um, that needs it. Many of the points as well that I've made have already uh, was going to make, have already been made. I would add, however, to Representative Regenberg's um, initial laundry list of things that are great about distributed generation is the fact that distributed generation, because it is distributed, is much less vulnerable to things like hurricanes, to actual to things like attacks, because it's distributed. So you can't take down one centralized place in the same way. Um, so if you you know so if a large centralized power plant were to have a tree fall on it, some some awful thing happened. You have many more people without power, whereas if you have in a distributed generation system, energy coming from all over the place and it's much more protected, uh, both against natural elements and potentially sort of hazardous, hazardous man made things. But, but if the grid is down, the grid is down, regardless of whether it's distributed or not. Correct. That, that is true. I, it, depends, it depends to a certain extent, though, on where the energy is actually being produced and stored. So, in a distributed in a distributed grid, you have different things coming in at different times, even if it's all regulated by the same by the same grid. Um, for Sierra Club, supporting renewable energy technologies is one of the best things we could be doing it from a climate change perspective. As we probably already know, Rhode Island is facing a seven foot sea level rise uh, by the year 2100, which will submerge portions of downtown Providence. If we don't want to get this to get worse, we need to change how we create energy. Um, and in addition to the obvious positive climate impacts, 
Sierra Club also supports this bill for its social justice implications, right? <coughs> Opening up net metering to Rhode Islanders who currently have difficulty <coughs> accessing alternative energies because of either rental properties, or shade properties, and the like. Um, happy to take questions. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, Jared Cotton. My name is Jared Connell. I'm the uh, Director of Product Development for Borrego Solar. We're one of the larger solar uh, EDC providers and installers in the New England region. Um, much of our business in recent years has come from neighboring Massachusetts, and we've always had an active eye on Rhode Island and looked at several projects uh, here over the last few years and never been able to make something work. So we're particularly excited about uh, the possibility of net metering coming to Rhode Island. I'll keep my testimony very brief. Um, some of the particular points of the bill that we're particularly supportive of uh, include the following. It, this bill would allow for a wide range of customers to participate in, enjoy the benefits of solar, and be fairly compensated for the value of the kilowatt hours that are being produced. It does not require a detailed competitive procurement vehicle that's an annual or biannual or semi-annual uh, procurement vehicle. It allows for the creation of a market that is effectively always on. Um, and you do not need to wait for the next round or next auction or next what will, uh, competitive procurement vehicle to allow for a product to move forward. Provides for a cost efficient platform through which to deploy virtual net metering. It's a vehicle through, through which community solar programs that we've seen in neighboring states uh, become very popular, could be deployed in Rhode Island. Uh, it's a vehicle through which municipal, commercial, and residential customers who do not have roofs that are well suited to solar can participate in and benefit from. And finally, it, it uh, will allow Rhode Island residents to make best use of the federal investment tax credit that was recently extended for five years. Thanks for your consideration, my comments. Any questions? Representative O'Reilly, so once you, you're familiar, most of your business is done in Massachusetts. So That's correct. That. Okay. So I was struck this, uh, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, I was visiting a friend of mine and my parents who live in Sharon, Massachusetts. And my, my friend's house and my parents' house are about three miles away. And I was thinking about this issue because my friend has got his entire south-facing roof now covered in, you know, pretty, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, nice array. And he was showing me how his, uh, how his electric meter was running backward on that particular sunny day. And then in the two-mile drive between his house and where my parents live, I mean, I'm not kidding when I tell you every third roof had a solar array on it even if those were west-facing roof as, as opposed to south-facing roof. Mm -hmm. So is that just a case of people who live in Sharon are particularly um, you know, hungry for this technology? Is it something about the Massachusetts legislation, net metering specifically, or? Actually, I was in Sharon on Sunday, too, and I, I noticed that there were a lot of roofs there. I think it's common off the road in Massachusetts. Um, West and South, they will hear the two best orientations for it. So the West, you get a lot of peak production, um, but the best orientation anywhere in North America is South. I don't know the particular. Yeah, but it's not. It's not because of a, it, it's not a difference in virtual net metering that accounts for. No, no, it's just a, it's it may be a small difference in the payback period for a system like that. If you're oriented anything except yourself, South, you're going to get a little bit of a reduced payback period because you're going to produce less kilowatt hours. Yeah, but I, I meant the, the saturation that I witnessed is not because of the absence of this particular legislation. No, the, yeah, no, there's net metering in. It would be available to any of those customers, which is probably one of the larger reasons why there is such an abundance of installations there. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, Fred Unger from the Hartwood Group. Thanks. Chairman Kennedy, uh, Representative, thanks, thanks for having me. Um, I'm, I'm based here in Providence. Uh, I've spent the last several years developing solar projects in Massachusetts done about 80 installations. Um, almost all of them serve low-income housing communities, and almost all of them depend on virtual net meters and offset <coughs> um, As Jared just mentioned, Massachusetts net metering law basically allows anybody to virtually net meter and allows those transactions to, to happen independently uh, among any parties that want to buy and sell the net meter of credit. Um, one of the, I, I applaud what, what the governor's done in 
uh, expanding net metering in the budget. The challenge is they've done it in a way that um, adds more definitions and more little boxes to fit projects into. My own feeling is that in an environment where we're kind of desperately looking to expand the tax base and to create jobs, the way to encourage innovation is to encourage innovation in the business models is to remove all those little boxes and to remove all the restrictions. And what uh, this bill in front of you does is basically makes net metering fair and available to everybody. Um, representatives talked about uh, affordable housing, talked about the, you know, the, the low number of, of properties that are actually useful candidates for a solar wind project. Those are all really important factors to, to make the benefits of clean energy available to everyone. It, it's also important to enable innovation so that it'll bring the cost of providing those benefits down for everyone. Um, I, I just want to highlight that there's concerns some people express about the cost of these projects and that they're being subsidized. As Representative Greenberg suggested, there's been hundreds of value of solar studies done across the state or across the country, including one done by Acadia Center here in Rhode Island just a couple months ago. That all come out showing that the value of, of distributed solar is higher than net metering companies. So, as the previous speaker said, we really are subsidizing national grid, not the other way around. We're subsidizing rate payers today. Um, <coughs> I want to <coughs> talk about some of the objections I've heard to this legislation. And, but I guess before I get into that, I, I want to encourage this community to recommend that the language in this bill be substituted for the language regarding that meter in the governor's uh, budget proposal. We don't have that authority to substitute that language. If you want to bring that up with the House Finance Committee, since they're the ones who are overseeing the budget, then I would suggest you do that. I have, I have done so. Um, so, objections on, on this bill. Um, one is that it might cause some backlash national, from national grid that would encourage changes in rates and all that. The reality is the PUC um, in Docket 4600 is already looking at, at, how, at the cost and benefits and, and what impacts that should have on changing rates. So that concern is, you know, it's, it's basically a, being concerned about something that's going to happen anyway. Um, there's, there's been concern about um, local taxation and the impacts of, of expanding a large number of renewable energy projects in local community tax bases. And uh, the League of Cities and Towns is already working with OER and other stakeholders to address that issue. And I'm, I'm confident that will be worked out successfully. There's been concerns about land use. Um, in, in my view, um, most cities and towns at least have, have very good uh, land use and zoning regulations. Um, and unlike the development of roads or buildings, these projects have a relatively short lifespan, uh, 20 to 30 years typically, and they're easy to decommission. In fact, the large scale projects I've built have all, either the landowner or the city and town have required a decommissioning bond in order to get a permit or to get a, a lease in place. <clears throat> and finally, um, there's been concern about municipalities being disadvantaged in competing for good sites. Um, the experience in Massachusetts is the contrary, that um, by expanding <coughs> virtual net metering, municipal, hundreds of municipal projects have been built, saving the city and towns hundreds of millions of dollars over the life of the project. Uh, finally, I want to address the PUC's concern. Um, Representative Regenberg was kind enough to send me the letter from the PUC, and I was able to look at it briefly before this hearing. Um, there was a couple of concerns in particular. One relates to FERC jurisdiction, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, that issue has been looked at fairly extensively, and um, in particular, a gentleman named Carl uh, Rabago, who's an expert on these issues, has, has dug <coughs> very deeply into that question. Um, there's 24 
state in which some form of community net metering is available today. And almost all of them depend on virtual net metering. So it just deferred that concern. I, I think they would have been discovered before now. Um, the, the other issues are mostly uh, <coughs> relatively minor issues uh, that can be addressed in amendments to the bill, um, particularly um, issues about block island power and um, pass power. Um, so I, in, in closing, um, I just uh, want to thank you for considering this bill um, and encourage you to, to make virtual net metering open and available for everyone. Thank you. Any questions for Frank? Thank you. Uh, Joan Wyless signed up in opposition to the bill on behalf of Pasco Utility. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Mike Kirkwood is out of town and he was out of town when the bill got um, posted, so he will be submitting his testimony after. Um, Pasco is opposed to the legislation as it's written. I've spoken to the sponsor. Obviously, they're not opposed to net metering. Um, Pasco does, in fact, net meter, and we have about 30% renewable in, in Pasco right now. But the bill as written would totally unravel the success that Pasco is um, seeing. So we would be very happy to be exempted out of the bill. Um, I've spoken because Pasco is the second largest utility in the state and a very efficiently run um, operation, as the chairman has often times nobody, recognized. Nobody can get power from them unless you live within that district. A lot of people would love that opportunity, but can't do that. Right. So, um, again, we'll submit testimony upon this uh, return, and we're happy to work with the sponsor um, with the potential um, to get exempted out of it. Thank you. Any questions Thank for you. Joe? Thank you.